So thanks everyone for coming today. I know this is kind of short notice, but I'm really pleased to welcome an old buddy of mine here, <laughs> uh, Gunhild God, Hoganson. Uh, yay! <laughs> from uh, University of Tromso or UIT. Um, Gunhild is a professor of critical peace and conflict with a foundation. Her research has looked at the interactions and tensions between perceptions of state and human security in a variety of contexts, with a particular focus on civil military interaction and Arctic perceptions of security. And I do remember seeing pictures of you on Facebook in a tank in Afghanistan, which I thought was like super brave and also equally terrifying. Um, Gunhild was one of 10 experts selected as a member of the Norwegian National Evaluation Committee to examine Norway's efforts in Afghanistan. And her focus on security in the Arctic has ensured that she was among the first awarded a Fulbright Arctic Initiative Fellowship for 2015-2016, and that coincided with the U.S. Chairmanship of Arctic Council, after which she was awarded the Nansen Professorship at the University of Akawari for 2017-2018. And she's currently leading a project examining civilian agency in population Population-centric and hybrid warfare scenarios, as well as a project investigating the trajectories of indigenous territorial rights in Russia. And we're pleased to welcome you here to the University of Calgary and back home to Alberta, I guess. And I'll just let you roll with it. Okay. Um, I think I have this thing, so I don't need this. There. Well. Thank you, Mary Beth, <laughs> for, for letting me just bully my way in to give a presentation here. But uh, uh, as Mary Beth said, I'm working at the, the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway, it's called. And, uh, but I grew up here, wasn't born here, but I grew up here. Uh, and, uh, but now I live in Tromsø, I've lived there for 18 years. And my background is security studies. Uh, and because I moved to Tromsø, that's what got me interested in the Arctic. It was kind of a default thing. You know, you move there. Does everyone know where Tromsø is? Anyone not know where Tromsø is? No one wants to admit that they don't know where Tromsø is? <laughs> well, you know how Norway kind of curves over the globe that way? Okay, it's in that curve. So it, we're, well, we're about 250 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle or so. Uh, but it's not the same as uh, like the Canadian Arctic or, or the American Arctic. Um, but in any case, so uh, I started working on, um, it was a combination of things. It's actually trying to be really opportunistic. I was at the University of Tromsø and I was like, well, okay, so I, I guess I better start doing stuff on the Arctic. And uh, at that time that I was there, it was in 2001, human security was a concept that was kind of the cachet at that time, didn't last long, but nevertheless, it was uh, very cachet at that time. And Norway and Canada, were really interested in this, uh, this concept of human security. And I thought I'd just throw those ideas together and think about human security in the Arctic. So actually most of my focus, my work, has been in looking at both the pros and the cons of using this concept of human security in the Arctic. Now I will come back to that, but that was back in 2001, so now it's almost 20 years, that I have been working on these topics, plus, yeah, hanging out in Afghanistan every once in a while, and uh, so that's also security studies, but a different venue. Um, but I've been spending almost 20 years looking at, at the Arctic setting and looking at security. So why not write a handbook, you know? So, uh, and Rutledge, Rutledge wanted to uh, have a handbook on Arctic security, and that's why I'm here, because this is the first Routledge handbook of Arctic security, so there you go. Uh, ignore the price tag. Um, this is like the libraries will buy this, and you can download chapters uh, on the ebook options or something like that. Um, but this is uh, attempting to be a comprehensive coverage of how to understand security in the Arctic. And I say comprehensive, and the reason I introduce my comments by saying you know, that my focus has been on human security, quite often, and, and correct me if I'm wrong and let me know what your views are about, about security, quite often people sort of go to a default position about security and think it is about the sort of the, the, the use of military force to protect borders. And quite often that word is, is associated with uh, with, with, uh, with the use of force, 
It can be associated with violence. And the Arctic, well, that is, you know, that's peaceful. That's, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing happening there. Why would you use this term security in the Arctic? Um, and this is actually why I think this handbook and why I'm trying to push it uh, is very interesting because we look at a very broad understanding of security. Uh, in fact, just as a little sideline, the, the, the concept of security has a very long history for one and for, for the other, it's not always been associated with a, a militaristic position or with the state. If we look at the, the roots of the, the term, now I'm looking into Western uh, political thought when it comes to this, but if we take a look at the root of the term, it's about a freedom from worry or care of the individual that we can exist, but not, not just exist like survivalists, you know, from day to day and, oh, I survived the, you know, I've made it this far, but that we're free of worry. We're not worried that we have no roof overhead, we have access to food, we have, we can survive and we have a future. So there's a time dimension. So you could say security in general is about, you know, who is it? Whose security are we talking about? So then we can talk about actors, right? You know, who, is it an individual? Is it a state? Uh, we can talk about um, the values also. So we need to know about that. There's the actor and then there's the values. And so well, what is it? Why is it that this person or this state or this particular actor, um, what is it that they are securitizing in a way? What is it that they value so much it's important for X, Y, or Z to survive into the future? So when it comes to values, that can be um, human life. So we value human life. So if the human life is threatened, that would be a security issue. But it can also be identity. Uh, communities that have certain identities, if those identities are threatened, threatened with potential uh, eradication, indigenous peoples have experienced that uh, over long history, over the entire <laughs> world. So the eradication of an identity is, uh, can be important, and that can be a security issue. So. It depends on who it is we're talking about or what is going to be secure, on what basis, that's the values, and what are they going to do to establish security. So practices, you know what? Uh, in, in the state concept, which is a very narrow concept, we're thinking about, well, security is secured by virtue of, of a defense force, you know, and that's going to protect our borders or, or whatever. Uh, but that's one way of establishing security. Establishing security can be very different at the individual or community level and can involve different types of, of practices. Um, so it, it could be about like ensuring that access to water and, and that kind of existential question, access to food and access to water that has nothing to do with a militarized conception. And so otherwise, the things that we value, it's not just absolutely everything that we value that becomes an issue of security, but it is that that in combination with two additional factors, it becomes a security issue uh, in that it has to do with the survival of that which we value, but over time. So again, um, I was in, um, uh, I was talking to Rob about, uh, he's saying, oh, you're all over the place, because now I'm in Calgary. A couple of days ago, I was in Reykjavik. Well, about two weeks ago, I was in Siberia, in Yakutsk. <laughs> And I was not a normal October, but this is how it went. And uh, it was interesting because I was at the, um, uh, oh, what's it called? The Northern Sustainable Development Forum. And uh, this was an opportunity for people to talk about, um, and many different indigenous leaders were participating in, in these meetings. And I was talking about security. Now, this is an interesting thing to talk about security in Russia, because there is a very heavily loaded concept of security, which is heavily militarized. So when they're talking about well-being, because in a sense, I'm talking about security that's more of a concept of well-being rather than this sort of militarized sort of force and use of violence posturing. And um, so I was talking about how uh, uh, these, these five factors to going into security, and I mentioned survival. And one guy, he just hooked onto that and he goes, we don't just survive here, we, we live here and all that. And, and uh, this was going through a uh, really, really, really bad translation. So uh, I don't actually know what he got out of, uh, out of my talk. But anyways, he really fixated on that issue about 
we do more as indigenous peoples, we do more than just survive, you know, it's over, uh, we, we live here and we thrive and all that. Well, that is what security is about. When you take a look at, it's so important, we want it, that thing that we value to survive, but over time, so that we do have a sense of well-being, we are free from worry about that particular thing that we value surviving over time. So that is what um, the work that I've been doing on, uh, doing, uh, has been looking at our Arctic security. And, uh, and so we have this, this wonderful handbook. And this thing is, it's like the mother load of Arctic security. But also Arctic security is a moving target because conditions in the Arctic, both natural and political and social, these things aren't static, right? So it's always something is changing. So in a way, making a handbook, like, I mean, in some respects, this is not the decisive word, but what this is, this is uh, where we're at, at the moment, but we've tried to, to make this book in such a way that we do have lessons learned and, and we can draw from, from the various chapters that are in this book uh, over, over time, uh, that there is relevance also in a few years about this. So we have, uh, we have one section that is theorizing about security. So now what I just said, you know, about these sort of five factors is sort of more abstract. That's in the book, but also taking a look at, okay, if we take these different factors and we look at these different definitions of security, how does this apply in Arctic settings? How has it applied over time in Arctic settings? We look at uh, um, environmental security. How do we understand that? Because there can be a very state-oriented for the state, the environmental security perspective, or it could be an environmental security perspective that's very community oriented, or one that's very much rooted in the environment and ecosystems itself, looking at human development as a threat in and of itself. So we've got those sorts of pictures going on in this particular book. I might say there's 35 chapters. So it's, it's a hell of a book to assign in a course, right? Everyone's gonna love you. Um, it's, uh, but we, we cover the, the theoretical aspects and then we go into uh, the, 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 the so-called Arctic states. The, the states that we have decided are called the, the Arctic states and they're Arctic states by virtue of the fact that there are eight states that have part of their territory in this region that we define as the Arctic. Even defining the region of the Arctic is a bit of a pain in the ass uh, because there's so many different ways to do it. Is it the polar circle? Is that where it is? Or, or is it just defined by tree lines, tundra, you know, sort of the ecosystems? Is it defined by that? Um, so we discussed that as well, the, the very political aspects about how we even understand what the Arctic is, uh, not least because it's definitely not the same across this. We can take, you know, cut the top part of the globe and call that the Arctic, but it's so vastly different across that whole area. Uh, if you're in Siberia, for example, where I was a few weeks ago, it wasn't that cold, but I have been there in February, minus 50. So, and actually where I was in Yakutsk, it's under, it's beneath the polar circle or the, the Arctic circle. Um, it is quite a ways beneath uh, the Arctic Circle, but it's incredibly cold and it's barren uh, or relatively barren. There's, you know, tree growth and stuff is, is quite stunted. Tromsø, where I live, is actually quite lush. The coldest we get, I mean, Calgary gets colder than Tromsø. We get to, I think our record now is minus 21. And that's the record, so that's really getting cold. I mean, we're normally in the winter time. Sometimes we're above zero and it's nasty because it's all melting. But you know, like the conditions are so different. The European Arctic is vastly different from the Siberian Arctic. And even the Siberian Arctic is difficult to compare with the American and the Canadian Arctic. So we, we have these sorts of differences and, and it's a, a difficult territory in which to talk about security because it can be very different. The actors, the practices and the values can differ because it's not only according to the region, but it's also according to the people. So in this, the way we chop off the top of the globe, uh, we have the, the Arctic states. And I guess most of you are familiar with the Arctic states. And the, uh, Iceland is an interesting question because it's under the Arctic circle, but it's considered sort of like wholly part of the Arctic. 
possibly the only Arctic capital, but all the other states, their capitals are south of the Arctic, however it's defined. Um, so this is the region we have, and so this is, uh, so we talk about the Arctic Eight, we also talk about them in relationship to the Arctic Five, and there's interesting politics about that, the Arctic Five being those states that actually have a coast up um, in, the, in the Arctic region, whereas, um, what is it, Sweden and Finland do not have, uh, have a coast and, uh, yeah, uh, and Iceland, yeah, well, Iceland, yeah, exactly, and Iceland's that weird one, you know, and so it's, it's just kind of hanging there, out in the, the water there. So, um, so we, we're discussing those things, but then we do move it, we move into forms of governance, and uh, looking at um, issues of governance, not least the, the, Arctic, uh, the Arctic Council, but we take a look at various uh, ways in which interla international law applies in the Arctic region, even though it's international law that may apply across the globe, like the uh, United Nations Convention of the Laws of the Seas, but all, how this all applies. So, so we're trying to map what, what's happening in the Arctic right now, what can we learn from this, uh, and, uh, and then we also go into, um, uh, we take a look at non-Arctic states that have interest in the Arctic, as well as institutions. So we're taking a look at, well, what's the relationship between NATO and the Arctic? That's kind of interesting. That's not uncontroversial. So we're taking a look at, at those sorts of things, the OSCE and, uh, and the Arctic, the EU and its interest in the Arctic, uh, and China and Japan. So. As we know, and these are giving us uh, pictures about, well, uh, the Arctic, it, perhaps it was described by Oren Young at one point, like, I don't know, in the 90s sometime, you know, as being, as being characterized or stereotyped as sort of like this barren wasteland that no one's really concerned with and, you know, no one lives there really. I and mean, he, he wasn't saying that's how it is, but he was saying it's often characterized like that. It definitely is not being characterized like that today. And as you all know, an increasing number of state and non-state actors are really interested in the Arctic. And we do move from all those state actors that are, they have their Arctic policies, like the Arctic Eight and the Arctic Five, they have, uh, which are much the same. They have their Arctic policies, how they want to develop the Arctic or how they want to protect the Arctic or, or both. And also how they're operating militarily in the Arctic because that's also an issue with, within these complexities. Um, but we take a look at people as well. There's over four million people who live in this region, however we choose to define the region, uh, and they're coming from a wide variety of communities. In some parts of the Arctic, as we know, it's dominant indigenous peoples who live there. In other parts of the Arctic, it's dominantly non-indigenous people who live there. Uh, and then all of these communities are, are quite different. So we take a look at security from the level of the individual up to the state, up to the international. So we try to cover a hell of a lot. And I should also mention here, it's uh, the editors, my co-editors, and oh, thank God they, they saved my butt with this particular book, because I was the one who was assigned this, this, um, this task to put this together. But I was very lucky to get uh, Mark Lantain and Horatio Sam Agre uh, along to, to be co-editors. Uh, and just as sort of like a side note, we all work at the, United, at the University of Tromsø in, in Norway, but we all have Canadian backgrounds. So how's that for you? Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is what the, the book is, is about. And just to sort of think about security, um, yeah, further, uh, I would like to sort of come up with a, one of the, some of the problems we're working with here. And uh, well, it's a problem that I'm working with actually. So, uh, and that is understanding security and trying to um, think about this as, uh, well, for the two, two things that the Arctic, can we look at it as something that is separate from the West, rest of the world? Is that, is that useful for us? So like a book on Arctic security, in a way I'm kind of challenging the book already, you know, because of the title. We talk about Arctic security, but there's so much that has to do with the rest of the world as well, that it's not only about the Arctic, it impacts this part of the world, but it's very much integrated with the, uh, with the rest of the world. So that's the one thing. And then the other question is, there's a, um, a narrative, you could say, and 
you've probably heard it. Have you heard the narrative, the Arctic exceptionalism narrative? Um, and it's an interesting narrative because it also caters to this characterization of the region, uh, if not this sort of barren wasteland that no one cares about and no one's gonna have war there anyway. Um, it is characterized very strongly as a very peaceful region. And true enough, I mean, we're not driving tanks across borders and going in all out violent conflict in, in this part of the world. Um, however, it's, uh, it again, and this comes back to whether the Arctic is part, is part of the rest of the world or not. Every single Arctic state has been engaged in Afghanistan, including Iceland. Not many people pay attention to the fact that Iceland was uh, active in Afghanistan. I mean, not too many, let, let's say five. But you know, <laughs> nevertheless, Iceland is represented in Afghanistan. So all these Arctic states, and even in the latest intervention that started in 2001, even Russia was a part of that intervention because of the fact that in the beginning, it facilitated a lot of the logistical uh, maneuvering to get into Afghanistan by that intervention. So Arctic states, are in and of themselves not necessarily peaceful. Uh, and they are engaged, and it's not only Afghanistan, but Iraq, in Syria, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as addition, in addition, um, we see, we understand conflict in particular ways, like with regards to, um, with regards to violent conflict, but what about conflict that is not necessarily violent, but nevertheless, quite intense. For example, what we see now since uh, Russia's um, incursion into Crimea and the activities it's taking place with, I'm saying all of this very politely in case there's, this was an interesting thing to try to take up in Russia as well. Um, there, we use different language to talk about these, these processes. But in any case, uh, because there's sanctions against Russia, this is having a large impact on the Arctic, both with regards to Russian development, uh, further development, not least of their oil and gas capacities, because they are still heavily interested in that. Uh, there isn't a very heavy uh, press about um, uh, climate change discussions, uh, perhaps by some, but, but it's perhaps, I think it's fair enough to say it's not like primary number one uh, topic, um, but as well as its uh, cooperation at the moment with China to facilitate that sort of development that it was earlier uh, cooperating with with other countries, a lot of the Western countries, and now it's turned its, uh, its look eastward. These have geopolitical implications. So we're taking a look at how Arctic states are are part of the geopolitical activities taking place around the world and where geopolitics from the rest of the world is also very interested in the Arctic and what's happening in the Arctic, not least with regards to still access for resources, but also with regards to transport and, and getting across the, uh, the Northern Sea Route. Um, so the Arctic isn't, isn't by itself. And, it's, uh, it's an interesting question to me. Can we talk about Arctic exceptionalism? Because it's a very static picture as well. Because all these changes are taking place, we're seeing changes in the climate. We're seeing changes politically. Uh, we're seeing changes socially. And then can we constantly claim this Arctic exceptionalism? And one thing that I find useful with such a book is perhaps if we have different security perspectives and we start to see how they play and interplay against e each other in certain circumstances, these different and, and different security perspectives, what I mean is say a human security perspective amongst different communities, how do they interact together? Um, environmental security, uh, the protection of the environment, and particularly with regards to climate change, state security that's interested in securing its borders, and economic security, ensuring that because Arctic states, the vast majority of them are heavily dependent on extractive industries still, you know, so which is an interesting position to be in. We're, in the Arctic, it's claimed that climate change is happening far more rapidly than any other part in the world. We are also contributing to the processes that are contributing to this climate change that is making our climate change faster than any other part of the world. I mean, it's a very interesting kind of cycle. So economic security 
is coming into conflict a lot with, with environmental security, you could say. So a comprehensive security build, uh, picture could perhaps be more useful for us to see how these dynamics are playing out over a given time, and that we don't assume that they're the same all the time. Uh, not least because it's very important to see how changes are taking place. And if changes are taking place such, if we were to just assume that it's peaceful and we're, we're just like, la, 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 you know, and pretend like nothing else is happening over, over the, the longer time, then we're not necessarily observing the dynamics of security perceptions in this particular region. And we could miss the boat on certain aspects of uh, certain actors that are trying to demonstrate their power to get their security perspective up front, you could say, or dominant within the region. Um, some will argue that's a militarized version of security. Some will argue that uh, there's like Russia, again, has been um, mobilizing uh, uh, military forces up in the Arctic, particularly in the Kola Peninsula. It's very interested in protecting the Kola Peninsula. Do you know where the Kola Peninsula is? Yeah, roughly. Well, you know like how Norway sort of goes over the earth like that and Tromsø is here? Well, you just sort of walk a little further along here across the border at Chiakanes and then it's not too far away and you're at the Kola Peninsula. And there's a nuclear uh, establishment there with a kind of a nice uh, load of weapons, you know. Um, and so there are things like discussions in Norway, for example, there is a concern that if Russia feels threatened, not necessarily by Norway, it may actually, this is one of the theories, I am not, you know, it may actually cross the border into Norway to create a buffer to protect the Kola Peninsula. So these are some of the discussions going on. And, and that kind of narrative, to a certain degree, is gaining steam in certain circles. That the military aspect of security is now becoming more prevalent, more prominent. Um, as well, you could say, and this is what the project that Mary Beth mentioned that I also do, is the ways in which, I mean, Arctic states are engaging in kind of weird stuff with regards to dissemination campaigns, which we refer to as hybrid threats and if it gets militarized, hybrid warfare. Um, Arctic states are a part of that dynamic. So, uh, and, and Arctic communities, insofar as we're gonna label them as Arctic, are targets for a good part of those dynamics, are targets for dissemination. So to what degree does Arctic exceptionalism in this, because Arctic exceptionalism is a discourse or a narrative of security. We're peaceful, that's it. You know, that's how it goes. And let's hope that we don't have violent conflict anywhere in, in that particular region. But it may not be about that anymore particularly when it comes to dis disinformation, because you can destabilize a region quite effectively without any gunshot being fired or without a tank going over a border. So uh, I can end with just saying th about the way that this book tries to cover the spectrum of how we can understand security in this region, tries to uncover the complexity of the region away from a an idea of you know that sort of barren, uh, no one lives up there and, and all that kind of stuff, absolutely not. It's of interest to increasingly more and more countries around the world. I think Singapore, just a week ago or so, has launched its Arctic strategy report. So Singapore, uh, I mean, nothing against Singapore or anything, but it's interesting. They're not that close by. And you wouldn't think that they're going to be, inter and there, these countries didn't have these sorts of reports before, but this region is of increasing interest to the rest of the world. So that's what this book tries to capture. I really hope this university gets it into the, is that library thing that's over there. They need at least five volumes then, just sort of spread it around in that. Uh, so, except for that glassy uh, kind of a thing. Um, yeah, and, uh, and if we're interested in a discussion about comprehensive security, then, or anything else for that matter, please feel free. So, voila, go out and buy the book. Or download some chapters. Do you need the microphone? Yeah, or? I can see the, I can see the <laughs> You can be jogging around. There, there, there. We've got a question in the back. 
No, you have no. a nice gaming voice. And please introduce yourself because I don't necessarily know all the faces. And uh, Jeff Gilmore. And where are you? Uh, are you located here at the university, or? Uh, I'm a research associate yeah, for many years. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, is really geared towards uh, Arctic Council hmm. and their involvement on security. Uh, I know they're involved with search and rescue, and they've got various committees. How uh, how interested are they are they on specifically on this this topic with respect to? Security matters. Well, versus NATO, yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's the, that's the hard side. Oh, yeah. Uh, this covers a lot of the issue areas that are addressed in the Arctic Council, because as I've said in this particular book, we're trying to cover a much broader spectrum than just military security. As you undoubtedly know, the Arctic Council has that little footnote that says, we're not talking about military security. Okay, fine. But they're actually talking a lot about environmental security, from low, uh, human security, about indigenous peoples, environmental security as it relates to human security, uh, search and rescue is one thing, but there's the, there are pushes, you know, like with the Coast Guard Forum, uh, that also sort of pushes into, for some of the states, their Coast Guards are on the military side, some states are on the civilian side, some, you know. So there are these organizations, you could say, or attempts to have some sort of cooperation that also slide a bit into the military side. But they're, at the Arctic Council, per se, they, as you know, don't address military security. But what's in this book here, they address a lot what's in here, because we're talking about particularly peoples in, in the Arctic. We have a whole section on that. We're talking about environmental security and economic security and, and how states and peoples are dealing with those things in this particular region, particularly in a context of such change that's taking place. So I would say the Arctic Council, they should get a copy of this too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. I should also mention one of our authors is sitting here in the back looking very sort of, uh, what is it, <laughs> hiding in the back. <laughs> Rob, he's, he's uh, yes, <laughs> he's got one of, our, uh, one of our chapters as well. So, you know, U of C is represented. Mm. So I, I have a question, or maybe it's more of a comment. So we, it, it's a discussion we have in the on the environmental side of things about is the Arctic actually unique? And um, maybe not, right? Except, mm. if you, except for the cryosphere component, or cryosphere and people in the same place, with, or the sea ice. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in this idea of, of Arctic exceptionalism, because I think it's foolish myself, or and I think you make a nice point about the role that the Arctic states play in global, non-peaceful global initiatives and the ability to influence the global politics. So I just wonder if you have any general comments about the EU's position on, on the Arctic. And I, because I saw uh, this morning or yesterday that the EU issued a pretty B big statement about, you know, we're not going to let the Arctic do what the Arctic countries do, whatever they want, because of the role of the Arctic. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but it seems like you saw the same thing, right? Maybe one or both of you would like to talk about the a little bit about the role that the EU sees for itself and how the other Arctic countries have been responding to the EU with res because it, even on the side that I'm familiar with, with which is with, with respect to research, the EU is putting millions and millions and millions of euros into the Arctic, right? Hmm. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Rob, why don't you say something about it first? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been blabbing the entire time, so. Uh. Sure, thank you very much. For those who don't know me, I'm Rob Hubert. I'm uh, with the Department of Political Science here. Um, I don't have the chapter on the geopolitics. Um, um, she, Grunhild, asked uh, Whitney for that. Uh, but um, He didn't write it either. No. Uh, I do have the chapter co-written with a PhD student um, on the Canadian side. The challenge that we have been facing with the Europeans, and this is one that has, uh, we can trace it all the way back to 1985, is that the Europeans um, see that the, or at least they've tried to create an environment 
where the normal rules and many of the, the, the points that Gunhild was making about the Arctic not being exceptional, it's just like any other place, the Europeans have taken this position that they have a right to involve themselves in Arctic affairs that they do not share in terms of others coming into European rights. So we've had the situation, for example, um, where for environmental purposes or, or, or a normative, uh, they've said that they are against uh, the harvesting of uh, marine mammals. And what this has ultimately meant is that they have been very strongly against the uh, what was a developing trade in seal by the uh, northern indigenous peoples. And so the Arctic Council was, this is one of the reasons why the Europeans have not been invited to participate as an observer is Canada since it saw this as an attack on its northern indigenous peoples, then felt that it was the Europeans are trying to have a standard that they don't apply to themselves. And, and what the Canadian government often referred to is that the Europeans can, uh, can have their policies of allowing foie gras, but if it's cute seal cubs, they're against it. And so this was the essence where the indigenous peoples, the ICC in particular, were quite strong. Now, what I'm leading to is that we have this tension, and it gets precisely to the point that, that Gunhin was raising, of state practice. The Europeans want to be involved, but they want to be involved without necessarily paying the necessary price of those who are in the area. For example, one of the major policies and, 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 and as was just mentioned, the Europeans make a bit, are increasingly saying that the Arctic seaways should be international waterways. And where that is, that's a direct attack on Canadian Arctic sovereignty because the Canadian position, of course, is that the Northwest Passage is internal waters and we do it for environmental purposes. The Europeans are very clearly increasingly being aggressive in saying that these are international waters and therefore anyone has the right to come through it as long as they follow international standards. And so what we are seeing arising for it with the Europeans is that there is a growing tension uh, between the Europeans wanting to have the say but overlapping with the state sovereignty um, practices of Canada, United States, well, not so much United States, no. but uh, on, the, on the Northwest Passage. But on the, on, the, on, the sea, on the sea mammals, that's another issue, but also against Russia. And in fact, uh, Germany, just, or uh, France just released an Arctic strategy in which they, uh, in effect, have just said that they did a freedom of navigation operation through the Northern Sea Route without telling anyone that it was a freedom of navigation. They're sort of doing after the fact. So we're seeing a whole bunch of factors coming with these non-Arctic states trying to insert themselves. And I think that it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting watching what happens in, in the next few months, actually. And, and what I think is an interesting dynamic is that, uh, exactly like you say, so the Europeans want these waterways to be international. Uh, Canada doesn't want the, the Northwest Passage to be uh, international, but the U.S. does. Russia, on the other hand, doesn't want it international, you know. So Canada and Russia, in fact, are on common ground with regards to the sea passages, uh, whereas you have the U.S., who would be then in favor of what the EU is saying. And then while the EU is mucking about and moralizing about what Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples, for that matter, with regards to uh, harvesting of, of sea mammals, because Norway Whaling is, uh, is on the menu. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite common, actually, and has been common in the Norwegian context for a long time. It's, Norwegians aren't doing this for testing scientifically like other countries might be doing, but actually eat the things. Uh, so um, you have these interesting dynamics. And then China, because it can't, it's in a way, we can't talk about, we can't even talk about one of these interested actors without seeing also the relationship with the other interested actors. And China too, which has in the NATO context, as you were, I think you mentioned, so, or no, you were mentioning uh, NATO or one of, someone did. Um, when Rob and I were at a NATO conference on Arctic stuff, security, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, China was really at the forefront of the discussion. Oh my God, China's doing this and the other. Not, uh, not least also engaging in hybrid threat tactics through economy, through their investing in Arctic, uh, in Arctic activities and stuff like that. Uh, they're heavily engaged in, in Iceland. Um, 
It is a complicated matter what they're doing in Greenland. So, you know, uh, what was it? Trump wanted to buy Greenland and uh, in part because, well, then at least China doesn't get it. I mean, China isn't that heavily invested in, in, uh, in Greenland and they're a partner in a project that the Australians actually are trying to get off the ground, which is mining in, Nas no, say that, what's that city, the town called in Greenland, Nas Nasuk, I think. No, Southern Greenland. You know, hmm? No, not Nuke, uh, farther south. Anyway, I'll, I'll look it up. But anyways, there, there are these mining things, but they haven't even got them totally off the ground. China is a partner in this. But uh, it is very interesting. Oh, and also uh, China is interested in providing a train up north, uh, which is really interesting. Not to up north, and I mean in, the, in Finland, but going up north from Helsinki through Rovaniemi up to Sirkenes in Norway. And this is very interesting for the Norwegians because our government isn't buying a train. You know, we're not getting a train from our government, which is a huge logistical problem for Northern Norway. This is not a non-issue. It has to do with Norwegian security as well, like even state security. The, the logistical problems we actually have in the North, if in the event that any sort of problem should arise in, in that part of the world, not least that uh, it's right next door to our good neighbor, Russia. But this is of interest. What China is wanting to do in the north is of interest to Finland, Sweden, and, uh, and, and to Norway, or at least parts of, of these countries, you know, the northerners in these countries. So, and China is actually working its way up against non-state actors, that is the northern communities, and saying, you know, hey, we can do this for you, we can do that. And, and you know what? free market, right? So like China is allowed to be doing this, but it's not like it has only economic implications. It has economic implications, but it also has heavily political and geopolitical implications. And so it's very interesting, this tension between the non-Arctic state actors or international actors like the EU and, uh, and this, this region and the increasing interest, yeah. Mm. And that just killed all the questions. Ever. No, there you are. Uh, Brian Mormon from the Department of Geography here in, mm. in uh, Calgary. Um, in Canada over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, we've seen a real growing of, of Indigenous folks in the North and their cultural identity and, and strength and organization. Do you see that in the other Arctic countries as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends. I, I can't just say blanket statement. Oh, yeah. And everything's going peachy. But um, the Sami in Norway, for example, have over years, they have also definitely been uh, marginalized and oppressed in, in the Norwegian state. I mean, there's a long history there. They also endured residential schools. They endured the uh, marginalization of Sami language. Uh, where, uh, as a matter of fact, it was a shameful thing to recognize that you were Sami or to self-identify as Sami or pr present in any way as Sami. But that has changed quite a bit. There's still more to be done. Uh, but um, we have a Sami parliament in Norway. So, uh, and that is quite a large initiative. It, it's non-binding uh, legislation they propose, but it often gets taken into the national parliament in, in Norway. So. The way the Sami are able to uh, build up their rights across Scandinavia is different because in Finland it's different than in Sweden and then in, in Norway. So I can speak best to the Norwegian context, but uh, amongst indigenous peoples in the world, the Sami are considered some of the most powerful indigenous peoples in the world because they have been able to negotiate with the national governments a number of, of rights and such. And, and like I say, they're, they're still, issue areas having to do with land. Norway is looking to Canada and taking a look at the land claims procedures and stuff because that is not, re it, it's not implemented in Norway. Uh, because also the, the population is very mixed in Norway. So to say that this land is particularly belong or, or you know, only certain people can live here or whatever. We have the Finnmark law, which has ensured the people who live in that region have access to the resources there, um, not oil and gas resources, but other sort of natural resources, because there are very many people who are Sami who are living there, but it's also for the non-Indigenous people also have those rights as long as they are from that area and stuff. So, so we have these sorts of things uh, happening in, in Norway. So it's interesting because the experience of Indigenous peoples are both, can be both very similar but also very different, of course, you know? So um, 
there's, it's very good to learn from these different experiences, yeah. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the seal hunt in the European Union, yeah. is, I'm, this is far beyond my area of expertise, but yeah. um, is cultural security a thing that uh, the indigenous folks are pushing for? They probably don't use the language of security. Well, it depends, right? Um, and that's also something that I think is interesting, why I opened with, you know, the, the general perception people have about that word security, because there's some folks who think oh, that that only has a negative militarized sense, and it's not about a sense of well-being and a, you know no worry in the future and such. Um, and so some communities outwardly reject it. We're not going to talk about security, but we're going to talk about you know well-being or or whatever. Um, but cultural security in terms of ensuring that their cultures survive over time, absolutely. So there's, there's more and more efforts being made to recognize, uh, the, again in the Norwegian case, to, to recognize where uh, the Sami, uh, like Sami territory, even though it's not segregated Sami territory or whatever, like Tromsø is also Sami environment, and the Rumsa in, in Sami language. Um, and uh, it's trying to, I remember there was some debate in our local newspaper about who could sell, um, because our tourism industry is getting quite big, you know, it's like the thing, right? Go to the Arctic and uh, whatever. And so you're going, uh, there was a big debate about who could sell products that represented the Sami cultures. Uh, can you be non-Sami and sell these things or can you, do you have to be only Sami? And then even if you're only Sami and you're selling a product, actually if you look at it, the product was made in China. So like how is this a, you know, like it, there's, there's interesting blurry lines here. And, and so I think it's still being worked out. How, how does one protect culture? How does one not exclude others from learning about it and enjoying it, so to speak, but not that it gets appropriated or, uh, you know, you gotta, yeah. So it's, uh, it's an ongoing negotiation, I would say, still, definitely. You need to use a mic because you've got to get on, on TV. In North America, like in Canada and Alaska, and I think Greenland too, yeah. which I guess technically is part of North America, right? It's all about food security, right? Like that's, there's no hesitation there for people to mm. describing that. But there's legislation, it just made, reminded me of the legislation in Alaska, which is the Reindeer Act, which mm. prevents anybody except Alaska Natives from raising and selling reindeer in mm -hmm. Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so it has had a, if depending on who you talk to, it has sort of depressed the ability of, of people to, um, build out reindeer husbandry as an effective industry because only Alaska Natives are allowed to do it and it's not a cultural tradition among Alaska Natives ah, the way it okay. is in and in fact when they brought reindeer into Alaska to they brought over a bunch of guys from the Russian Arctic and that didn't work out very well um, they didn't get along and mm. there's some great stories about that. And then they brought in some Sami folks to work with. And there were only very small number of Alaska Natives that took up reindeer herding. And it was, um, uh, I, I think it's actually a really interesting case about these tensions between um, indigenous and non-indigenous and economic development and security in terms of livelihood and all of those kinds of things. So it's kind of interesting to hear that about Norway because I didn't realize that and of course it's made in China right like all those little expensive Sami well cats. thankfully not everything yeah. is but but they're little dolls like this was exposed in the newspaper and like you could buy a little Sami Sami doll which is probably a weird thing to do to begin with but anyways they're selling these little dolls dressed in the Sami kofta and, and stuff and they're made in China so I mean that's an interesting problem or, or challenge really you know who owns what in that that mode of production uh, right there. But it's interesting, I, I did not know that about Alaska, that, that reindeer herding was not a, a sort of a thing for the indigenous peoples, because of course the Sami, they do. And the Sami are the only ones who can herd reindeer in the north. But the thing is, if there's reindeer in the south, those are wild reindeer, go ahead, shoot them. You can't shoot them up in the north because they are farmed reindeer for all intents and purposes, right? They're going across. so. So there, but that's what's so interesting, and that's why we can't conflate the experiences of 
indigenous peoples either. And another thing was, I remember I was, the only time I've been in Alaska was at uh, the Arctic Energy Summit a few years ago. And I had been at a different conference hearing from certain indigenous leaders that were talking about the problems of extractive industries and particularly oil and gas and the problems it was causing them with regards to their own traditional uh, economies and that this was a threat to their traditional economies. Then I go to, the, uh, to Alaska and there was a, an indigenous leader there and he used these words because this is when Shell was pulling out um, on the coast of, the, of, of Alaska for their, their exploration of uh, oil and gas. And uh, he was saying how the reduction of oil and gas production in Alaska would be, his words, the death knell of his community. So the survival of his community was dependent on this. Now, I'm not saying that his interpretation of that experience was necessary, but it's very interesting, the language and the competing narratives we, we have about and we hear from different, um, different people. Uh, well, yeah. to that point, yeah. that was probably somebody from the North Slope. And yeah. if you were to talk to somebody from the interior, they would have a very different perspective yeah. on it because of the way the money has flowed out mm. to the indigenous communities. It's been very uneven distribution of the wealth from offshore oil and gas in, in mm. Alaska, which I think is probably, for somebody who knows, I know the Alaskan situation better, but I think that's probably also true in Canada with the, mm. Western Arctic, but I couldn't say for sure. And there's interesting relationships between indigenous peoples and uh, extractive industries in Russia as well. And in the Siberian context at that conference I was at in Siberia a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a presentation and it was fascinating because under the Soviet Union, Indigenous peoples were, in a sense, protected. You could say there's this patriarchal system that was ensuring that they could engage in their traditional economies, which is reindeer husbandry and reindeer herding, uh, and ensuring that there were not, uh, they were essentially shooting wolves and bears and making sure that the wolf and bear population wasn't too large because these were killing the reindeer, right? So, so that relationship was established between indigenous peoples and, and the state. The state has since pulled out. Now, Russia as a state has not engaged in those sorts of activities. They've largely left everything alone. But what has happened then is that the wolf and bear populations haven't increased. And what certain communities are doing is they're now uh, taking their uh, reindeer closer to the extractive industries areas and they've made arrangements with the extractive industries, the local sort of like oil and gas uh, industries to protect their migration routes and, and protect their reindeer. So there's very interesting negotiations happening at the non-state level between these people, which includes extractive industries. So the big evil extractive industry is, it plays a very complicated role in the lives of, uh, of people and depending on where they are. So, but they're doing it for their, their well-being, their security a sense, yeah. Do we have other questions? Mm -hmm. Speaking of Russia. <laughs> As we um, like to do, yeah. I saw a talk a bunch of years ago about the, basically the depopulation of Siberia yeah. with the fall of the Soviet Union. I was wondering if you just have any update on that with the reemergence of Russia's interest in the Arctic. Are we seeing those big cities that basically got emptied out or for the most part emptied out, are they growing again? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, it, I don't know about all the cities in, in Russia, and of course, the population is declining across the entire country, right? So uh, they've had an enormous population decline, and they also have a not so healthy <laughs> average age limit, or age, uh, what is it called? The, 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 the mortality rate. So, so that hasn't been too healthy either in, in Russia. But what is interesting, I mean, in Yakutsk, there's still 350,000 people who live there. So by Arctic standards, that's pretty ginormous. By Norwegian standards, that's ginormous because we don't, we have one city that's past a million, that's Oslo. The rest are in the 200,000 range, you know? So, uh, but we're only 5.3 million, I think now. Um, but uh, in, in Russia, what is interesting, so they implement, the Russian government implemented what's called the Hectar law, the, yeah, the, the Siberian Hector law, Hector, where any Russian could get for free a hector of land in the Russian, in Siberia, and as long as within three years they develop that land in some way, shape, or form, 
it was theirs. They had to make investments into there to try to get people, you know, like go forth and yeah, do whatever, you know. So this caused huge problems for indigenous peoples because they're saying, well, if there's a bunch of people who are getting a hectare of land and our reindeer uh, migration patterns go right through there, this was a problem. So the Republic of Sakha Yakutia negotiated with the Russian government to protect indigenous rights which actually in itself is quite interesting because we think of the Russian government as, oh, yeah, shut up, you know, you can't do anything. In this case, they didn't totally confront the Russian government, they didn't stop the Hector law, but they were able to negotiate ways that this didn't uh, trample on, on the areas that indigenous peoples use. But there are those sorts of, like, that's the one measure I'm familiar with to try to send people out there. But it's a tough place to live, you know. Uh, I don't know. Like what constitutes developing your hectare? Planting some carrots? I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say plant some carrots or something. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I, I really, I don't know into yeah. that detail what the, uh, yeah. Hmm. But isn't that interesting too? Because it, that, that whole hectare law almost takes for granted there's no one there anyway, so yeah. go ahead, take your hectare of land. So, uh, but at least Saha Yakutia pushed back on that with the, the federal government, so yeah. Mm. yeah? One, thing, one thing just to add <laughs> too, is that um, what we are seeing, we've been talking about the sort of empowerment of Northern indigenous peoples in, in, in Norway and in Canada. In Russia, there's been a very strong effort, as with any non-centralized agency, <coughs> of depowerization. Oh. What we're seeing within the, uh, the Russian representative on the Arctic Council, Rapion, most of their um, leadership have been replaced from what were, uh, were seen as, uh, as, as locally elected indigenous leaders are increasingly being replaced by members of the party, uh, <laughs> Putin's party that is, and representations. And so we see a depowerization of Rapion. They have also been delisted at least once, which meant that they were basically made illegal in terms of functioning within uh, <coughs> Russia. And they have had severe limits placed on their ability to interact with other outside agencies, mm -hmm. and that includes the other indigenous people. So, so we're seeing within, within Russia, this is not, once again, this gets to your argument, that it's not Arctic-centric. This is something that is being seen right across Russia as it moves towards becoming an authoritative state again. Uh, but the indigenous peoples and the gains that they had made are being severely uh, marched back, as are all, all other independent agencies within Russia. And what's interesting is uh, people who are indigenous peoples in Russia, there's quite a few who have actually left Russia because it's not safe for them to live there. Uh, but they don't stop fighting for their rights in their country. Uh, they just do it from the outside. So there's very interesting movements and also <laughs> informal movements taking place in Russia. So it's not like a static situation. You know, Raipan got taken out and <laughs> that's it. So. I mean, people are doing things, and that's interesting too, you know, because they're very interested in maintaining their culture, right? They're very interested in maintaining their traditions, their sense of security within their community. So, uh, I mean, it's it's, but it's so difficult in uh, in that country, definitely. Hmm. No? Okay. Well, thanks, Brenda. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you.